so much. I love you. Please. I love you. I love you. Please. I feel sick. I feel really sick. So first to the experts is Sissy, Brandon's sister, a love addict. Oh, she's classic. I mean, that, that one little snippet summed up craving, obsession, and withdrawal all at once. I mean, I always say that withdrawal from love is about the same as withdrawal from heroin. You just listen to more Adele songs. <laughs> um, <it's> just, <laughs> Um, and that the physical symptoms are about the same, and that was portrayed well. And, and it, it went throughout. I mean, she uh, jumped into bed with a guy that the rest of us knew was an asshole, right? But she was unable to see it. She literally could not see the wedding ring on his finger. And I have been there. I swear, I have just like that ring just suddenly morphed into a signet ring or a school ring or a, or just, or a suntan. It just like, it's amazing. The denial can be so deep that you actually be, you become blind <coughs> and um, just just no time before you jump into bed immediately because God forbid you should get to know them because then you won't want to see them again or worse they won't want to see you again. Um, but what I think that the film somewhat missed is that in my opinion is that a lot of people are acting out sexually so that they don't have to feel those feelings of their love addiction. I think that mm -hmm. sex addicts are not predatory men and love addicts are victimized women. I think that there's a great deal of overlap and flip-flopping between the two. But that's something else yeah. for discussion. I, I, I tend to also look at length of time. I think early relationship, crush and love, and love addiction all look the same. Um, and I think you have to wait a, a length of time when someone moves out of that dopamine stimulating phase and when real relationship shows up, if they're able to tolerate and work through, great. But love addicts won't allow that conflictual phase to ever happen. They'll keep it always in that dopamine stimulating, dramatic, conflictually based place. But initial relationship looks very much like love addiction. They're the same thing. It's an important part of evolution that we think enough about you and obsess enough about you that we want to be around you to, to procreate and to get in a relationship. So I always think it's imperative to wait a length of time to see if they move out of that phase or if they stay in that entrenched dopamine producing Yeah, phase. I mean that limerence phase has to come to an end and I agree right. and Helen Fisher talks about it being evolutionary yeah. so right. that we can bond and attach but love addicts push the fantasy constantly so that they don't ever have to be in the reality of what's going on and they lose themselves to relationships, they can end up stalking. Um, typically, the love addict is, um, you know, is born out of profound abandonment to the opposite sex parent or same sex parent if the person is gay. So if you've got a woman like this who was abandoned by her father, and likely both of these were abandoned by both of their parents because they're not well people, um, she's going to be seeking that love constantly and choosing people that will inevitably abandon her. The sex addict, however, is love avoidant, typically. This guy's love avoidant. He doesn't have one love addicted bone in his body that I can see. But yeah, some but sex I, I think that's the way it was addicts. drawn. Yeah, I think that's the yeah. way that was drawn. I think that it, it, to, it can be more complex than that. I, for instance, had an uh, attachment disorder with my mother. Sure. Um, and I see a lot of people that, and I'm straight. So I see a lot, a lot of, of a lot of flip flopping. I see, I see a lot of males and females who will go to the disassociation and the desensitization of sexual acting out to avoid those horrible you know, um, feelings of loss True. and grief that are a product but that's of on the, the love yeah, And that's on the extreme side, and I agree with that. And I think on the watered down side is the culture created sex and love addicts, or love mm -hmm. addicts, I guess, where we live in a very codependent, love addicted, culture where if you look at the archetypes in films and the storylines, it breeds and reeks of well, love country addiction. western music. Yeah, absolutely. Listen to any I mean, song that's on the radio. Yeah. Genre it was born so out of I think I guess on the watered down <laughs> end of the spectrum, it's the yeah. culture that created versus the attachment. Mm -hmm. But when we look at really these are attachment issues in yeah. my opinion. Mm -hmm. And all female sex and love addicts have mother hunger issues. They were absolutely abandoned by their mothers 
in addition to the father. So women can be love addicted to other women even if they're not gay because right. they're seeking that kind of love and connection. But are there criteria the way there, there are for sex addiction? What about for love addiction? What are the signs? How can somebody know? I, I look at one, the shrinking down of their world. Uh, healthy relationships are expansive. You're bringing new people in, your world's expanding, you're experiencing new things, you're doing new things, where for a love addict, everything's shrinking down the, to protect um, your drug, which is this person. Um, they won't let anything come in between them and that. And then also, again, behaviorally, attempting to keep it in that uh, you know, fantasy base, as Alex pointed out, and, and that stimulated base and that dopamine place and not allowing it to go further outside of that. Do you check his Facebook page before you check your Facebook page? Have you changed your route home to pass her house? Have you parked outside that house and waited? Do you feel a jolt of adrenaline every time you see a car that might be his or her car driving by? Um, let me see. Checking do you, voicemail. Yes. How, how do you check, check your voicemail more than once every 15 minutes? Um, do you leave a second or third or fourth message before the first message has been returned? because maybe it got lost in the ether or maybe you forgot to leave your number or maybe you called the wrong number or you know I can and again it's contextual because all that's also cute early on and I think that's an important part of early relationship <laughs> and crushing and dating and it feels good to and think again, about and again what's appropriate when you're 18 is not appropriate when you're 42 right. well you know, early on maybe but not later down the road <laughs> uh, for, uh, for the addicts that are present um, do you want to talk a little bit about love addiction? I, I have some experience in this, uh, my own sex addict. I, um, I went through some serious patterns of, of love addiction years ago, which was something I had to do a lot of therapy on. And, uh, and I think one of the terms that gets thrown around is magical thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you ascribe magical properties to the person who's, who's the object of your affection. Uh, and what my particular pattern was, was, um, you know, my, I had a, a, a profound abandonment in my childhood, and I would re-traumatize myself. I, my, I would pick relationships that people who were unavailable. And, um, and I think one of the things that was going on unconsciously was, you know what, if, if I can get this person to love me, then I can fix the fact that, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't get the love that I was supposed to get from my parents when they abandoned me. Um, and and uh, I think that was a lot of what was going on. Uh, and the other thing is, is, you know, my homeostasis was abandonment. And I was comfortable in that miser misery of abandonment and I kept, that was just what was familiar to me and so I would keep picking that unconsciously, I would keep picking that situation where I'm going to be unstable, you know, or I'm going to feel like, you know, the rug's going to get pulled out from under me at any minute and, um, and it, I think a lot of it for me boiled down to self-esteem that uh, it wasn't until I really learned to love myself that I was able to pick somebody that was capable of loving me. But uh, that's kind of my experience with it. And I'm bud, sexually compulsive. For me, a clue that I might be a se sex and love addict is picking out china patterns and curtains on a first date for the house that we're going to live in for the rest of our lives. Uh, another way for me to see it was in its absence. Uh, when I was satiated, in other words, I could be flirting, and when I finally got someone to pay attention and indicate, yes, they wanted to have sex with me, the sex addict in me was really shocked when I turned and walked away because I realized later that it was because I got what I wanted and that was to be wanted and desired, and I didn't have to have sex. Uh, Carmen, sex and love addict. Um, my my love addiction was also from, you know, I was love addicted to my mother and it was the abandonment um, that turned me into, which I learned much later, which turned me into the, the low bottom sex addict. I, d I could not deal with um, the the intimacy. Once that happened, I, I just could not. I could not trust anybody else, and I could not. Um, I did not want to 
subconsciously I just was not willing to trust anybody else and I was not willing to ever go back to um, trying to love somebody or trust uh, anybody and um, so that I, I, it was just it was easier for me just to be a, a, that that low bottom sex addict and not ever uh, let anybody else in and and become uh, the victim actually um, that ended up working for me for a very long time um, okay, I think we're going to move on to the final clip. Uh, recovery from sex and love addiction. 